So welcome guys to the Pewter Texture Trinketon workshop or class. And this is such a fun, actually quite in in uh, in essence a relaxing class because it's it's very repetitive um, of the same uh, technique uh, once once we get started and we have our basics down. So a little bit about the um, the substrate for this. I use my um, little texture tins and I buy these on Amazon. So they just, they hinged and they super nice to, um, you know, you can put a little bit of batting in here. Um, put some, actually, this is a great gift box for your pendant, by the way, if you're going <laughs> to maybe make those pendants and, and want to give them away in a very super uh, little box. One of the things with these tents is that they have some kind of a coating on that um, might interfere with when we attach the adhesive tape to it. So what I usually do is I, in case I forget, is I make sure that I sand this um, down. And for some of you in the kits, um, I've given a little bit of sanding paper here. Um, when you sand, just make sure that you can clean your work surface again, uh, wipe it away or so that you don't end up with those um, residual sanding grain. So all we need to do is really just break the steel on the, um, on the tin. And you can see um, it's kind of made it a little bit duller, my slightly coarser one. And then what I do is I make sure that I kind of go around the edges as well um, to make sure that I've, I've broken through that, whatever that um, sealant is that they have on the tin. So we've got that out of the way. Make sure that you clean your work surface and that you don't have that, uh, those crumbs here. Um, okay, so we've got our substrate ready. When I do, um, when I cut the pewter, obviously I cut it from big sheets and then I size it by really just measuring um, the length and the width and then just cutting the pewter to, to that size. But because this has these rounded corners, I, I use my, um, this is a memory something, I don't know. Um, scrapbooking corner punch. I think you can find it at um, a lot of the, the craft show, stores. And what it does, it gives you that round little corner. So this is uh, just cutting the adhesive tape. And you can see that I've got my corners rounded here. And then I did the same with um, the pewter. So just popped it in because it had these straight corners. Um, I wanted to make sure that I get these round corners. Much easier to do it with a handy dandy little tool like this, um, as opposed to trying to do it by hand. Of course you can do it by hand, um, by just kind of looking at your, um, your uh, pewter, if it was um, still straight, I would put my little tin down and then just line around the corners here with a pencil and then cut that with scissors. And the same would be for the um, adhesive tape if you didn't have this little corner punch. But I use that a lot because I, I make a lot of these little tins. Um, so that kind of takes care of the preparation for the tin and for our pewter. Okay, so when you buy uh, purchase pewter from me, um, again, there's always, you'll see that there might be some squiggles. And the back of the pewter is always um, the inside of the roll. So before I start cutting my pewter uh, from the big roll, I always uh, give it squiggles. And then when I'm ready um, to work with it, I give myself a little B. And this is a B. And I'm not going to mark the front because the front is, we're going to be working with that front, but I'll remind you what's the front. If you're in doubt, just um, refer to the B side or the side with the, the squiggles on. The other thing that I wanted to do is um, to now find the position of where I'm going to be putting my 
little metal embellishment. And the way to find it easier, I mean, you can certainly use your ruler and mark it. Okay, you know, um, so 4.5, um, you know, anyway, you can mark it with your ruler. I'm not, I'm not good with inches. I could probably figure it out. So 11.5, but for me, the easiest way to find the, the center of my pewter is I fold it at the top and very, very gently just put the two sides together and I'm folding the back side together and I give it a little tweak just right at the top here. And I'm gonna mark it now that that's my center and you can see it at the bottom as well. So just a little tweak, you're not folding it flat completely. And then I'll do the same on the sides here. So just corner to corner. This is easier for me than doing the math. I have to admit, especially this time of the morning. So pop it up, there we go. Right and if you have a, um, your hardboard handy and you want to just straighten this up, if you do have a brayer, you can put it on the hard surface. And again, um, I know that uh, you're seeing this in mirror image, um, but it will all be straightened out when you receive the, the video. So I usually just brayer it down. I can still see it, but that's okay because we're gonna apply a lot of texture um, on the, the pewter anyway. But this is a quick and easy way for me um, to kind of find my uh, happy place in terms of uh, finding the center point on the pewter. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna look at is starting in the center with our little embellishment. And when you look at the embellishment, you'll see that this uh, there's two sides to it, obviously. This side is embossed. It's got the little raised balls on this side. Um, the texture is raised. And then when you look at the, the back, you see that the texture um, is recessed. So very important when we work with this uh, little embellishment is that you want to have the raised side or the embossed side touch the back of the pewter. So, You'll, if you're in doubt, the side with the, the raised little um, balls there, that goes in the center. So I'm going to center it. I'm going to line up that point with that point, that point there, and line the side points up with the, the other side here. And I'm going to take my painter's tape. and just pop it over and make sure that it sits nice and tight. So once we've got this nicely secured, you make sure that the raised, the embossed area is touching the back of the metal. We can turn this around and take our fingers. Okay. And I'm hearing someone's music. <laughs> okay, so just gonna take a little bit of the Vaseline. And I've run my finger over the metal, so now I can see exactly where it is. So I'm gonna take a little bit of Vaseline or any kind of lubricant that you have, if you have some baby oil. I'm not fond of using the, uh, you know, like olive oil. Um, it all, always seems to be so, so thick and, um, but if that's all that you have, then, then that's fine. So added a little bit of the Vaseline and we're now going to use our paper stump. And for those of you that are using your brand new paper stumps, um, always nice to have one end of it rounded. And if you can retain the other one, uh, kind of pointy. If you only have one of these, um, that's super great. I 
take my paper stump and if it's brand new and I want to just soften it uh, a little bit, I take my sanding block, I sand um, on the, the surface uh, of the sanding block, I round the points, I can also add a little bit of Vaseline to my paper stump and that just kind of softens the paper and helps things move along. You can actually add your Vaseline over pretty much the whole um, piece of pewter here because we're gonna be, it'll, it'll be helpful whenever we, we work on the surface. So I'm gonna take my paper stump. You saw that I did a round about here with my finger and that just kind of helps me stretch the metal over the metal um, embellishment. And now I can start with the paper stump to start transferring the texture. And the first little um, rubbing that I do is right in the center because now I can really see um, my uh, design of the texture plate um, pop through. So I can go around the edges here and then start, start rubbing. So when you rub, you're gonna see the raised areas of the texture plate um, become available, you sort of start showing up. And you're gonna end up rubbing with your paper stump. And the better rubbing that you do, um, the more effective your um, design will be uh, when we put the ink on. Because what we're aiming to do is to get those little recesses um, nicely defined so that when we put the ink on, the, the ink will sit in the recesses and that, that's what will give you your contrast. So you'll see that there'll be a point with your, your paper stump when you're pretty much not making any further headway here. So I'm gonna change my tool. If you have this little plastic eraser tool, um, handy, that, that's very helpful to get the next step of the, the detailing. So you can see that when I do this, it doesn't leave scratch marks, but it kind of allows you to get into the, the recesses a little bit easier. So I'm gonna go around here and then kind of work systematically so that you know where you've been, but you can very easily see actually where you've been. So I'm gonna just work clockwise here. Okay, you, I'm hoping that you guys started on this. This is great. Just get started on it and um, rub over the, um, the plate first with the paper stump. If you have the little plastic eraser tool, just get on with it. Um, to get more of that texture. And what you can also do is once you've gone once around with the point of the plastic eraser tool, you can use the back of it and give it a little rub over the, the texture as well. Once you get to a certain point with the little plastic eraser tool, you can also use your stylus, your um, Teflon tip stylus, and add more, see if you can pick up more of the finer details uh, because the point of this uh, Teflon tip stylus is a lot finer. So one thing I would kind of just suggest is not to overwork the edges of this. Um, we're doing okay in terms of just maybe um, once around or twice around with the paper stump, um, a couple of times with the purple eraser pen, and then just once around with the Teflon tip tool, because the more times you go around the edge here, um, it actually fatigues the metal and you might end up breaking through it. Um, completely. Perfect. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is add 
or not add a border to the edge of the pewter. And the, the choice would be, so if you decided that you didn't want to add a border, this is kind of what your, your uh, project will look like. So no border along the edge here. And if you did decide to add a border, um, you'll see that there's a little raised um, line on the edge here and about two millimeters. So this line is about two millimeters in. And then I used a texture wheel to add the texture along the side here. So that's, that's kind of a choice. I'm gonna show you how to add a border and then you can decide uh, whether you want to or not, because that will kind of determine how we place our texture plates moving forward. So when I wanna add a border, I'm gonna use my paper pad and I want to add a little raised border. So if I was wanted to have an embossed line on the front, I'm gonna work from the back. I can take my texture plate off. So gently, gently, just um, when you remove the tape, um, just be gentle about it. Pop that out for now. And we're gonna add our little border. So I'm gonna use my ruler and like, Pretty much, I would say, maybe two millimeters in, um, as long as you have a little bit of spacing left on the edge to do your um, texture wheel. I'm gonna use my Teflon tip tool. I'm on the paper pad and I'm just gonna line nice firm and just get my line in there. And when you turn it around, you can see that there's a raised line on the front. So that would be an embossed line. I'm gonna go to the side and I'm gonna come back here and do the corners freehand. But first I wanna just get all the lines on. So again, from the back, on the back of the pewter, on the paper pad, and I'm using my ruler to go around. Nice firm pressure. Okay. Once I've got that done, I'm going to kind of just bring my corner around and follow the edge of, so follow the rounding, that's the edge of the pewter. And I'm just gonna be doing that freehand. If you have another dan handy dandy tool, um, that'll make it easier for you, um, then certainly go ahead and do that. But I'm just gonna go for gold with um, freehand here. And the same on this side. Okay, so I'm gonna complete this whole um, demonstration and then you can decide if you want to do the, the border or not. So I'm going to move it front side up on the hard surface and I'm going to use my Teflon tip tool. I'm going to line alongside that embossed line that I created. So I push, take my Teflon tip tool and I'm pushing up against that line and what I, when I do that, it refines the line and it kind of grounds it uh, into the design. So it looks like the line is fixed and it's not floating. So I'm gonna just push up against that. All the way around. I can do the same on the inside of the line. And when you've made a good embossed line that's nice and raised, it's very easy to refine because all you're doing is you're using your Teflon tip tool and pushing up against it. And that embossed line guides your Teflon tip tool as you refine because it, it can't go anywhere. You're, you're pushing up against a line that's stopping you from, from going over it. So that just neatens up your work kind of grounds your little line and 
gives you a good little border here. Let's say for argument's sake, just let's troubleshoot here. Let's say you do this. Oh, now I've collapsed my line. So this time I don't feel like I need to go back onto the, the paper pad. I'm already on the hard surface. I've already created the indentation. I can just go and fix it by putting my ruler back on uh, alongside it. And especially when you're working with the softer pewters. Um, so the, the late free pewter that we work with here is pretty much just a very high grade of tin. But when you work with this softer pewter that is tin coated and that has uh, more lead in it, um, then we can certainly, um, you know, it creates a little bit of a problem and sometimes your lines go a little wonky. So this is a really nice way of, let's say, troubleshooting and bringing back the line if you happen to um, not get a, a, a neat um, line from, from the previous step. So nice to go back on the hard surface it kind of just gives you a very flat edge uh, line. Instead of a round line, it kind of flattens it out. Okay, so the next thing that we'll do is if we did add a little border here, um, is you have, if depending on if you have the texture wheel or not, um, you can add, if you, let's say you don't have the texture wheel, you can use the back of your little stylus here and you can, add some texture to the sides here, if, if that's something you want to do. You can also do dots. I'll just do it, do a little demo on my, my scrap piece here. So you could potentially do little scratches like that. You can do dot, 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 dot. Um, you can do anything along the edge of this, but I'm a little lazy. So I'm going to be using my texture wheel. When you use texture wheels, um, one of the things uh, I just wanted to let you guys know, sometimes these texture wheels stick and a great way to get them to just work very well is to spray the wheel with a little bit of um, the WD-40 and then just roll it a couple of times over the paper. So this, if, if you do happen to run into a little bit of trouble with your texture wheels, um, that's kind of a nice way to work with it. Whenever I work with the texture wheel, I work on my paper pad, regardless of what I'm, uh, which texture wheel I'm working with. So normally along the edges of, uh, when I make an edge with the texture wheel, I want to have it as an engraving. And the reason for that is, is that we're gonna be flattening this edge anyway, when we put the pewter onto the tin cover. So we'll be, you know, kind of uh, burnishing it around the edges. And if you did a raised um, texture, it will certainly also um, flatten it out anyway. So. Along the edges, I always opt for doing an engraved texture wheel. And when we do an engraving of our texture wheel, that means we're working on the front of the metal, on the paper pad, and just giving it a good little roll. Sometimes it's helpful if you do a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, but the paper gives you enough of a softer um, substrate uh, sorry, softer work pad that it does pick up the um, the engraving of the texture wheel. So that works great. If I wanted to have a raised uh, line, which I, which I don't uh, recommend at this time, I would have done this from the back on the paper pad and my texture wheel would have ended up raised on the front. So I'm going to go scoot, scoot, scoot. And then my texture would have ended up raised on the front. It's a little hard to see with the reflection here, but this is raised and that is recessed in gray. Um, you can, if you have this little dotted border, the same would apply. So I'm 
can go with my little texture wheel. If I'm doing it on the front of the metal, it's a nice engraved dot. If I happen to have done it from the back on the paper pad, it ends up like a little raised dot on the front. So I'm gonna be using my horizontal wheel and on the paper pad, just go right alongside the, the embossed line that we created. Turn your pewter around so that you don't have to contort yourself. And I like working with the texture wheels away from me because then I can see where I'm going. When I'm doing it like this, I find it a little hard to see where I'm driving to. So this way. And people are often afraid of the texture wheels. So I'm not sure why, um, but you know, it's my driving instructor uh, said that you have to look where you're going um, when, you, when you're kind of weaving through, through those um, uh, road marks. So what I do is I keep an eye on where I'm going um, as opposed to focusing specifically where I'm at. So just something to, to maybe consider. Okay, so now that we've made a border, um, we can move on to placing our te uh, texture plates um, on the corners here. And I find it easier to, to just work um, with whatever corners I have or ends I have here on my little texture plate. That kind of makes it easy for me to, to get things with, with some form of symmetry. So I've got my two points here and I make sure that my raised area is gonna be touching the pewter. And I'm just gonna line this up with the edge of the line. And here we go. So the edge of the line here, and I'm kind, kind of lining it up with that point there, put it down, oops, and then I'm gonna tape it down. So bring out my painter's tape again, tape it down so that it doesn't move on you. Make sure that it's nice and secure. I'm going to be working on my hard surface again. Make sure that tape is down. And now we're repeating this step again that we did before. So my first order of business is always, I know it's not, not probably the best tool, but it's always on hand. Use my finger and then just rub along the edge here. I can see where my edge is. If you feel you need a little bit more lubricant, you can certainly put a tiny little spot of the Vaseline on again. And I'm going to use my paper stump and we'll pretty much repeat the step that we did before. Of course, you're going to stop rubbing as soon as you need, as you hit this line here, right? So same thing as we did before. I like starting with my little circular um, design here and just rubbing it nicely and then rub, rub, rub. And we'll do the same thing that we did before where we first rub with our paper stump. And then we progress to our uh, little stylus, um, uh, our plastic eraser tool, and then we progress to this. So you want to have your design end up nice and crisp like you did it on the first time. So I'll get, let you get on with that. Once you've got that done, the next, the next one would be to actually add it to the side again. So you repeat this step. So once you've got your, um, your two sides, opposing sides done, it, you can now very clearly see the placement um, that would work well for, for the sides um, of this little trinket box. So I know you're, you're not there yet, but it's, it's kind of the important thing was that I wanted us to just get the top and bottom sides in. 
and then it makes it very easy to know your placement for um, the sides of this um, the next step. So you can very clearly see um, it's kind of a natural uh, the triangles that are here, and this kind of makes it um, real easy to decide your your next placement here. So I'm again just on the edge of my um, pewter and right on the edge, the little uh, border that we created here. And then same thing, I'm going to taper down. I'm going to do that one, that one, and that one. And you can see that I'm lining up my um, little edge here with um, that line there. You can move it away a little so that there's going to be a little spacing between um, this uh, middle line and that one. In other words, um, so I have another one on the old viewer. So when I do this, I could potentially just leave a little space in between there and then carry on. So just be consistent uh, with what you're doing on the one side. Make sure to repeat it on the other side. And also a reminder again, when you remove the tape, um, be gentle about it and don't uh, kind of rip it from the, um, the um, pewter. Just be gentle, just gently remove the tape. And again, you're going to make sure that your texture uh, side, your raised embossed side, is touching the pewter uh, from the back there. So I'm just going to continue to do that all the way around. So you've got your work cut out for you. <laughs> but please do let me know if you have any questions. So we'll just go um, keep going with that. And it's very repetitive. So every time you do that, um, first step is the finger, a little bit of Vaseline if need be, and then the paper stump, the purple plastic eraser if you have it, and then the Teflon uh, tip tool. And just a reminder, don't be afraid to turn the pewter around so that you can get the best access when you're, when you're doing this. So keep turning it so that it stays a comfortable process. So now we can move on to the next step. Um, that's very exciting. The one thing I always do is one, once I've got my textures on, I like making sure that my um, background area in between the embellished uh, areas are flat. So you can use your paper stump or what I also like to use is the back of my... Um, my purple eraser tool, it's got a, a wedge part on it, if you if you have that one. This one's always super nice for kind of flattening. The important thing to do is to remember to be on the hard surface. So whenever you're working on the front of the pewter, um, flattening the background, you have to be on the hard surface or you'll kind of undo all your nice work here because the metal will then stretch um, to the back. Okay, so now we need to make a few decisions about uh, placing, if, you're, if you do have the ball and cup tool, placing some of these balls. Um, there's so many things that you can do with the, the different, um, with the texture plate and different placements and so on. Um, so I'm not going to be demoing this one. Um, but you can see that for, you know, if you want to get a little bit creative with the ball tools, you, uh, you can certainly do all kinds of things. I kind of, this one kind of got a little bit away from me um, and, and it was ended up being a bit of a different um, placement. For, for our purposes here, I'd like to sort of 
um, look at potentially adding some balls around the um, the embellishment or just having some random ones here and there um, at some of the uh, the key points here. So that's kind of going to be your de um, your decision. I'll just for the sake of kind of um, continuity and because this this would line up with your notes, I will just demonstrate the, the ball and cup tools here. But you've got the sample photo of this one as well. And I'm going to demonstrate the ball and cup tool um, real quick here. And then you can decide if you want to do a complete line of balls um, all around your embellishment here. That will kind of make your um, area that's vacant smaller, which is great, because then you can just do scratchings in that. And then if we do a little bit of a, a cleaner um, look here, that will be, you know, leave us this area to do some uh, engraving in. Okay, so I'm going to be getting my foam mat out. So when we work with our ball and cup tool, we're going to work from the back, and I'm going to turn it to the back. On the soft mat, I'm going to use my um, ball tool, push down, and give it a little swizzle. And I'm placing it at the at each corner of the um, embellishment. So push down, give it a little swizzle, give it a little swizzle here. And then I might just decide I'm going to do it in the middle of the design here. And again, push down, give it a little swizzle. I'm going to turn it around, put it on the hard surface, use the cup part of the tool and place it over the dome and push down. And that's your one step refining. Very important when you do this step to be on the hard surface as well. And oh, I missed one there. I'll go back on the foam mat, push down. Give it a little swizzle, come back on the hard surface, put the, the cup part over it and push down. Oh, and another one. Anyway, so what um, what I did with this particular design is just went and place some balls, top, bottom, on, on each of the corners, and then did a, another ball uh, in the middle there. And when you look at your sample. Um, sheets. I'm going to be doing the same here, here. Um, it's kind of, you know, the thing is, it kind of has a mind of its own. So there will be two balls together. Well, maybe then I'll just decide to do a third one as well. So this is a nice time to play with it and see what you want to do. So this is the other option. Again, like I said before, is to do the balls all the way around. So if you look at the line here, you'll see that it goes zigzag. So from here around right to the end. And then if you had space, you can put one in the middle there as well. Um, and then the same for the bottom. So just um, maybe start with the middle if you're getting, going to do all these rows of balls and then do the side ones, just to make sure that you have that center um, with all the balls as well. If you don't have um, a ball and cup tool, you can also use um, your Teflon tip tool or your um, stylus here. The important thing to keep in mind is that it's easier to poke a hole through with these tools than it is with the ball tool because they are not um, rounded. So let's say I'm going to use my little handy dandy plastic eraser tool. I'm going to go from the back. To prevent myself poking a hole through completely, um, <laughs> like I usually do when I do it on the foam mat with enough, another tool, is I'm going to be on my paper pad. Let me put my little eraser down. Oop, 
do a little swizzle. See that? That's kind of why not great to use. So give it a little swizzle, turn it around, put it on the hard surface, and I'm going to just clean it up. So push back on that. And I can use my stylus to array, uh, to refine around it. A little bit more of a process, but you can still get that. So let's do it with the, the Teflon tip tool, which is going to probably give us a slightly smaller bowl. So I'm going to push down from the back on my paper pad, turn it around, and you can see there it is on the hard surface, and I'm going to refine around it. So you can see much, much smaller little ball uh, there. But there's always a way, you know, if it makes a mark, it is a tool. And if you don't have um, these tools handy, then there's always a way of, of making a mark. Okay, so I'm going to continue to add my balls here. Um, I'll let you do your um, whatever works for you and what you have planned. And um, I'll just work away here at doing mine. And if you if you get stuck, definitely grab your sheets, your um, notes, and you can refer to this if you need a little bit of guidance as to placement of your balls. But it's sometimes just nice to, to play with it and see my, my key thing here um, would just be to have some form of symmetry because it does make the next step a little bit easier um, when you negotiate with, with symmetry as opposed to helter skelter. But that, that's up to you as well. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, go here and do all of my balls that I wanted to do while I'm on the back. So I don't necessarily have to flip. Uh, back and forth. I can do all of them at once, flip it over, and then cup, do all the cupping at once as well. Okay, so the next step that we're doing is we're adding some engraving to our um, surface of the metal. And engraving is when you work from the front and I use the hard surface and my little stylus and make some lines in the surface of the pewter on the front that will catch the ink when we do um, the ink process. So you can see here some of the um, scratchings that I've done, some of the engraving here. And the um, if you look at the other sample, you can see that there was a lot of space here that I had for engraving, um, but um, certainly there was, an, there was something to add some texture to it. So the decision that you have to make right now would be if you are going to raise all of these uh, uh, center, all of these little circles and half circles um, within your design. So in this particular sample, I chose to raise all of the um, circles and half circles. So I didn't put any texture in, uh, in them. In this sample, I did add some texture to the half um, circles that are on the outside perimeter of the, um, of the design and only chose to raise this center circle and then add another little bit of um, height to the, the uh, texture around this raised circle. So that's kind of a decision, design decision um, that you might want to make now. Um, so here is, yeah, so this exactly the same thing I did. I added some, um, just some uh, engraving to the outside and um, raise the, the inside. So that's, that's something you would need to decide now. So, um, or you can decide while I do the demo. So or anyway, we're gonna go, when I do the engraving, I'm gonna go 
on my hard surface, use my little sharp stylus. And when I do this, the little circles here, I'm just going to stay um, very simplistic and do some lines. You can color in those circles when you refer to your um, uh, notes here, you'll see that I've given you some examples of textures and you can do within that, that circle, whatever makes you happy, whether you just wanna color them in, whether you wanna repeat um, the line of the circle, if you wanna make half moons and fill them in, that, that is up to you if you want to make just little uh, round um, balls within that circle, just little squiggles, or do some spirals. That is, that's all your choice. I'm going to just stay rather simplistic and just do these half moon lines. And I find it easier to start in the center of the circle and then turn my pewter as I go and then keep going back to the circle. So I can do a little bit more once I've got my low lines going here. And you can see that texture there. So I'm gonna be going around and doing texture on all of these. As far as the inner um, uh, part of the design is concerned, I opted for also a rather simple design of adding just, um, and I'll, I'll show you how I did that. The other thing that you could potentially do if you wanted to um, is this, it's different from this sample, but I can use my texture wheel and kind of fill in um, this space here between the balls. So let me do that just to give you another option here. I'm going to take my paper pad because we work on the paper pad with the texture wheel and put my hand on it. Super, there we go. So I'm going to use my little dotted texture wheel and just for some, some extra options, I'm going to go in between and connect the dots of these balls. So I'm on my paper pad, I'm on the back, because I want that line to be raised. So I'm gonna go from the back here. And that just gives me a little bit of a different option. So when you look at it from the front, it gives you a super nice little um, area where it kind of um, captures and holds that design together. So I'm going to go on the front and I want to make sure um, I'm going to be using my little stylus. So I make sure that I'm on the hard surface and just on the outside of my um, texture wheel uh, border that I added, I'm adding another line. So something to keep in mind um, if that's something that, that would interest you. So I'm going to go, I'll just repeat one once more because now I'm I'm committed <laughs> to this um, design and I'm gonna go from the back on my foam mat, uh, sorry, on my paper pad, texture, roll the texture wheel, right? And I'm gonna go all the way around, but just for your purposes, I'll, I'll um, stop there and remind you, I'm gonna go on my hard surface. I'm gonna use my little, texture here to add my sharp stylus and just give me a line, engraved line on the outside of that dotted border. And you can see how nicely it contains that little design. So I'm gonna have to quickly go around all of this and do um, this little finish. You can decide, um, you know, again, like I said, if you're gonna fill in uh, the dots um, on the outside, if you are, if you aren't, then um, you can do start doing some texture in between here. So let me quickly just talk about textures in between. I've showed you the, the textures that you could use within the circle. The same applies for texture um, on this open area, or 
you can even decide to leave it blank. So that, that would be your choice as well. Um, I'm going to quickly do uh, finish just this section here so that I can show you how I would be texturizing this. Same principle, of course, as the engraving within the half circle. Um, but this one, I can see if I want to just add pretty much just color it in. Um, so I'm going to just work with this uh, area here so that I don't kind of hold you up here. Okay, so now I can decide what I want to do here. I can go um, if you're interested in this little area here, I really just started off by going around the circle and then making a little pocket of, of engraving like that. And then let's say I'm going to go here, do that. And then just filling in the spaces with the shapes while I still run around what, what is happening here. So um, very simplistic engraving. So here I have a little space that I wanna fill. And then the next um, engraving that I'll do is I'll kind of get a little creative. And then I follow along again, almost like a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, just um, creating, engraving as I go along and then following up with another let's say I do a little triangle like that so when I do the next one I'll go within that little area and maybe do something like this so it's very um, loose um, it doesn't have a fixed pattern but as long as you keep uh, consistent with kind of following the design and then creating, let's say create like a more of a rectangle, like rectangular look here. Um, here I can say, okay, I'm going to go along this line and create a triangle. Now I'm going to fill the triangle again and do that. So you can see the gist of just creating very simple uh, engraving and then following along. Here you can see a little bit better how I did that. And in some of the the spaces that were big enough, I would make another little triangle, which I can do here. Just lots of different ways. And it's very um, therapeutic to actually play with it like that and just take your time and just roll with it. So I'm going to continue to do that. Please ask any question now. This is a good time. Or, you know, as you design your, your, um, the ball placements that you've done or around the balls or et cetera, and you have any question, let me know. And I'll just con continue to work here, um, but I won't chatter uh, in your ear all the time. So. So now we're ready to, um, if we were going to raise, um, I, I'm going to raise the center part. We're ready to do the high relief on that. And I'm going to use my paper stump and my foam mat. We're going to turn it to the back. And I'm going to push out this center um, circle. So I'm going to start in the middle. And Gently, 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 just do a circular motion right up to the edge. I don't want to break the edge because then I'll lose my, um, my texture, uh, these little dots that are around the circle. So start in the middle and then push, 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 push. And I'm going to turn it around and show you what it looks like. So you can see how raised that uh, little dome area is. So 
like with any um, high relief, whenever we do something from, from the uh, back, we always need to counteract it from the front. But in this case, we're not going to be pushing this area down. We're going to leave that and we're going to eventually, I'm going to raise it more so that um, it's actually going to be a centerpiece for your little tin. If you feel that you want to push this little cir circle out a little bit more, the foam mat actually stops you from going too far because of the, the um, thickness of it. So let's say you desperately want to have it be more raised, then you can double up on your foam mat and push a little bit more. I kind of always try not to push too much because you don't need um, a super high relief in order to get a good, a good result. So the important part here is just that when you push it out, Make sure that your paper stump is soft and round so that you don't end up making um, lines on this um, area in the middle that we want nice and smooth. And you can also use your finger if your finger fits in it and then just push. But obviously if you have nails, um, you won't be doing that. So I'm gonna just smooth it out and then put it on the hard surface and there you can see how nice and raised it is. So I'll let you guys do that. And then let me know when you're ready. And I'll show you if you wanted to raise this little area a little bit more, we'll talk about that. But first, let's get that centerpiece uh, raised and then we'll go from there. Okay, super. So what I wanna do is this little um, area here, um, I wanna push it out a little bit more. And I find the safest way to do that would be with my fingers because I'm not pushing on it um, with a, a tool that can destroy my, um, my uh, texture uh, design here. So I'm gonna use my finger and I'm just gonna push in this block area, just very slightly push. And it doesn't take a lot. And then I'm gonna put it on my hard surface, I'm going to use my little tool here and just push along the edges here and flatten that area. And then you can see that there's quite a nice little bit of a raise. Um, I'm going to try and put it on this side. It's not a super high rise here, but it's enough that it makes it stand out from the areas that are a little bit more recessed um, on the side. So I'll just do it again on the foam mat from the back. Just push this out a little bit more. Okay, and then on the front again, on the hard surface, and just flatten that background. And that's always key in high relief is when you want to raise something is do more than once, like do a little bit at a time so that it um, you don't necessarily, um, you allow the metal to, to stretch gradually. Otherwise it might, you know, not, not work quite as well. It's not, not such a big problem with um, the, the smaller designs like this, but when you want to raise bigger areas, definitely you need to flip back and forth as well. So now we're ready to um, add the filler to the, uh, the center here. And the reason we have to do that obviously is if somebody would press on this, it would collapse. So it'll make a dent in that um, raised area there. And we talked about uh, in the notes, I did mention the fillers again. So if you're not doing um, a heat process, like the, the beeswax that we'll be working with today, you can do the Mod Podge, use the Mod Podge Dimensional Magic as a filler. And then you would pretty much just fill this whole area here. And just this whole area here. 
The thing with um, the Mod Podge uh, Dimensional Magic, it takes a few hours, at least uh, three or four hours for it to set completely. And it has to be left in a level uh, position. So if you're doing this um, technique, you can fill this and just leave it and then just watch for the, the rest of the process. Um, it's, it's a great way of using a filler. It's got this very neat little nib, but the dilemma for me as an uh, in, in instruction um, is that now I have to wait for it to try. So I always, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time use the beeswax. And it is natural beeswax. Um, Chanel, Chanel actually asked me uh, by email if you could use other wax. And the answer is no. There's something in the beeswax that makes it stick to the metal where other um, um, waxes does not. So I used paraffin wax before. And then when you pour it in, and you turn your pewter um, around, it pretty much pops out. So you just ended up making a mold uh, with wax as opposed to having it stick and um, filling up that uh, high relief area. So I have a little skillet here. Um, it's called, if you um, look on Amazon, it's called Personal Electric Skillet and or and it's seven inch or six inch and um, I'm going to pull it over a little bit more so you can see what it looks like. And it looks like this. And it has a, um, some settings on the side here. Um, I won't tip it to show you, but I usually, the sweet spot for me is usually um, a medium setting. And it's just um, past the half and then a quarter on so very much a medium setting. You want to make sure that your wax doesn't um, boil or you know splatter, um, and that's kind of a nice, neat, uh, you know, good temperature, uh, even temperature. And then I always just pull the plug when I when I undo this. I don't turn my knob off again, um, so because I've now found the sweet spot for it, and I just want to not mess with with that success so um, i use a glass dropper and i always warm my dropper before i use it because of the glass um, conducts the heat and um, if you have droppers like me that are plugged up um, the way that i unplug them is by actually just throwing them into the um, the wax here, and then I have a tweezer um, dedicated to just remove it. And then just get that to come out completely. And then this is the way that I do it when I'm in a rush. If I have about 20 glass droppers to unplug after a, a workshop, I put it on. Um, cookie sheet with some paper towel and um, just put it in a warm oven and wait for it to melt and then use my, uh, take it out of the oven, then use my um, tweezers to just um, lift them up and just let the wax run out onto the, the paper towel. So um, lots of options to do that. Okay, so the trick again is to warm the glass dropper and then to always face the dropper down. One of the things that we tend to do is we tend to pretend like we're feeding a little bird and then you tip it over like that. And then all the wax runs right to um, right in uh, in the rubber um, push, push thing here. And then it, it um, plugs it up. Okay, so enough about that. I pick up the wax, keep the dropper facing down, and now I'm just going to go over my area that I want to fill, and I'm squeezing and driving. And what I mean by driving is I'm kind of taking the wax and just pushing it 
to the edges here. I'm going to pick it up and squeeze. And the important thing here as well is not to overfill because you don't want this to become so high over the edges that it, it's going to fight with your design when you tape it to the, to the tin. So I usually just fill to the edge of the pewter, um, level with the edge of the pewter. So if you look at it from the side, it's just level with the edge and I don't overfill. Um, this is enough to make, to ensure that my um, design is not going to um, be collapsing. I'll just pick out the other drop over here that I dropped in there. And you can see the wax is lightening up there. And as soon as the whole piece of wax um, is light, then we're already ready to work with it again, which is beauty because that's that's quite great that we can continue to work with it um, so quickly. If you opted for the Mod Podge dimensionals, then you've now put, put it aside. And the one thing with the Mod Podge dimensionals is that sometimes um, when it's dry, it, it might have sh not shrink per se, but it, it kind of, um, makes more of a, a recess. And if you feel that you'd rather fill that up, then you can always add another layer. But it's very important to make sure that the first layer is dry before you, you do anything else with that. Okay. So, Chanel, you're, you're still waxing, right? Okay. I'll let you get on with it. It's a little bit of a process. Um, if you haven't done it before, just, you know, just to get your setup right and be comfortable with um, where your pot is and your um, dropper and so on. While Chanel is working, um, there's lots of other little uh, pots that you could use um, when, you, when you want to have... Um, use the wax, um, have a dedicated little wax pot. And one of it is the chocolate melter from uh, Betty Crocker. Um, it's a tiny little, almost like a little crock pot. And um, you can set it, you know, put your wax in there and let it melt gradually. And it kind of holds the temperature as well. Um, it's just to find the right temperature. So those are also quite handy. And I I look, I always look at the Goodwill or the thrift store for them. And they being sold for $10 and sometimes less. Um, the important thing is just to make sure that they work. So usually a lot of the thrift stores have outlets that you can try uh, and just see if those um, electric things work that you've purchased. So there's that option as well. I know other um, brands, Tim Holtz has a melting pot and so on with different little pans that you can just put in um, the pan that you want to use and have one little pan dedicated for, for wax. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. But the this little guy that I use came from Amazon and I've actually bought a few more because they're so handy. And um, when I travel, the, the long, um, the handle comes off and they pack up nice and, and um, compact. I've got my pewter. I've got a scrap piece of paper to work on. Got my alcohol, um, my paper towel and my permanent marker. So those are the things that I'm gonna be working on. And just a reminder again, um, that the permanent marker that I'm using is not a Sharpie. It's a um, water-based pigment marker. Um, I've, this, I've been having some problems getting the perma pack now. So now I'm using the, the uni proxy, but I, let me see if I have it here. Yeah, I have a uni proxy. The important one part is that it's a water-based uh, pigment ink and, um, it can be, so when you when you apply it, it can be moved, which is unlike a 
um, Sharpie. Once that is down, it's quite the mission to get it off again. Um, and it definitely kind of leaves a dullness onto the pewter that, um, that the Uniproki doesn't do, which is, which is super. Every time I, I use, uh, <laughs> find a good pen um, that allows me to move it, uh, it gets discontinued. So I used to use um, the pens from Grand and Toy, and then they changed the formula. It still says water-based, but when I got the pen, it would actually just, the ink would bead on the pewter. And when I wiped it, I would just wipe it away and it wouldn't actually drive it into the recesses here, which was um, what we're aiming for. And you can, if you don't have this uh, ink, um, if you don't have ink like this, um, you can certainly use black um, tempura paint or just black acrylic and then put it on and then wipe it off while it was still wet. So the next step is um, you're going to be cleaning the pewter first so that we can get a good um, clean substrate. We want to get all the Vaseline and grease and things off. Um, so I'm going to give it a little wipe here with my alcohol swab. And if you don't, like I said, if you don't have an alcohol swab, um, you can give it a little spray with your alcohol. The, the next step is, is even more important than, than the alcohol, is using your paper towel and wiping away the residual alcohol and the grease. Because sometimes people would use the alcohol swab and you know give it a good clean but they don't remove the residual alcohol and grease. And then um, if you were using that oxidization process, then sometimes that would not uh, go so well. I also want to, while I'm on the subject, just clean the back of the pewter as well. Um, it helps with the application of the adhesive tape. Um, and it even helps if you were using glue, and we'll talk more about glues, but remove the grease off the back of the pewter as well, and then wipe it with the paper towel just to dry it up. And there we go. So all cleaned up. Once we've got the, the pewter cleaned, and I'll just um, proceed, and then we're going to let you guys um, catch up and do all the uh, inking. But I'm, I'm going to demo the inking so that you can see where we go with this. So just to recap, I'm using not a Sharpie, but a, a water-based pigment ink marker that allows me to add the ink to the pewter and then move it. So what I'm aiming to do here is get that ink into all the nooks and crannies. And I'll do one section at a time because sometimes it does end up drying very quickly. And when I do one section at a time, I'm actually using a particular section that I did as a, as a unit. So for example, I'll do this little triangular area um, because sometimes you don't um, wipe away well enough and then you've got this very clear line of where you stopped and started. So got that very nicely um, inked and you want to not be shy about the ink. You want to get it into all the nooks and crannies, just a nice um, solid cover. I'm going to take my paper towel, I fold it into four and I like wiping in one direction because it creates a shadowing in one direction. So I'm going to wipe to the outside. And I'm using a flat paper towel. And I'll just keep wiping until I'm happy with the result. And you can see the difference between the area that's been um, as the ink 
as opposed to not the ink and how nicely it gives you that contrast. And that's pretty much how I'll continue to do this. So I'll do another section here. Very solid um, coloring in. Really want to get that black to stay in the recesses because that's what's going to give me that nice um, high and low um, difference um, and really just gives you that, creates that shadowing in the recessed areas that makes it interesting. So, okay. And when I, um, when I wipe like that, it kind of pushes the ink into the, the recesses as well. And you can clean off as much as you like or as little as you like. I kind of like it clean apart from uh, what remains in the, the recesses here. So I'll get you guys to, to, to do that. Um, I'm going to continue to do it. It's very repetitive. Um, if you find that you didn't work fast enough and sometimes it's dry and it won't move. One of the tricks that you could do is you could potentially just re-ink it again with um, the pen over the same area and it will re-ink it and kind of um, hydrate what, whatever was underneath it and then you can wipe again. So keep that in mind. If all else fails and even that doesn't work, then you can take a Q-tip, a little bit of your alcohol or your um, alcohol swab and just clean the area that, that makes you unhappy and then carry on from there. So there's always a way of um, getting things uh, cleaned up again if, if all else fails. Okay, so I'll continue to do this and then um, let you guys get on with it. And then when you're done, uh, let me know, but we can certainly take our time with that because this is a nice, um, this is a kind of an important step for creating uh, a nice um, finish for sure, a nice patina. And I'm kind of like having a little bit of that shadowing uh, in that half circle, because when we apply the color, um, you kind of get a look like this, which gives you a bit of a shadowing um, on the, the, the borders there, which is, which is quite nice as well. So I'm not, not averse to, to having that there, and I, I usually keep it in there so, and not, not clean it off. Once I'm done with the inner part, I just go around the edge again of the, um, the design with the marker and I just line just on that and make sure that I got some nice ink in all the, the nooks and crannies there. So one of the things that really pop when you uh, put this um, ink tech, use this ink technique, is that the deeper your engravings are, the more pronounced your um, they get when you put the ink on. So if you did very shallow engraving or you have a light touch, then the engraving um, doesn't quite pop as much because there's no recess for the the ink to grab onto but if you did a, a nice firm uh, engraving then it's it's real easy for the the ink to sit in the recesses there
And you can always revisit that engraving with this particular um, way of adding a patina in adverted commas. Um, there's no, no harm in saying, oh, goodness, um, I feel like I need to go and darken this a little bit more. You can certainly go and do that at any time and then ink it up again. Um, as opposed to the, the technique where you use the oxidization patina where you really don't want to go back and um, mess with it after it's completed because um, you know it, it might rust up your metal too and you never seem to you know when you when you mess with it after the oxidization patina has gone on um, you potentially have more risk of um, not getting it quite right as opposed to just letting it be uh, just let it be and let it go where we can attach it to our box. Um, so rem reminder again, make sure that your substrate has been sanded. Um, and we're now gonna add our adhesive tape sheet to the back of the pewter here. I'm gonna use my cutting pad and um, I have my X-Acto knife, my pewter, my double-sided adhesive tape sheet, um, and my tin. There we go. So what I need to do is I've, we've cleaned the back of the pewter. We're going to attach this to the back, stick it on, and then burnish around the edges. If you don't have the Sukrang double-sided adhesive tape, you can use something like Aileen's Tacky Glue. Um, it is a white glue um, that you would wipe, uh, put a blob on and then use your fingers and then just a very thin coat, go right up to the edge of the computer. You can also use well bond. Um, and when you, once you've applied it, just wait for it to become a little bit tacky and don't over glue because then you'll have glue kind of um, coming out all the sides and it's, it's not a fun thing um, to try and clean up, which is it's just a bit of a, a bummer. So we're gonna use our double-sided adhesive tape. I've already pre-cut my tape to the size of the pewter and I have my corners. So normally what I do is I would bring the, the tape to the corner and I normally stand up when I do this as well. So here it looks like I'm gonna be a little bit short on the edge, but that's okay. I'd rather just be within this because that edge I can burnish over the sides and we have enough tape on uh, the other areas here. So once I've got it uh, attached to the back of the pewter here, I'm gonna pull, it, pull the backing uh, paper off. Nicely done, done. So this is the sticky part stays behind on the on the pewter. I've got my tin. Um, if you were doing something directional and you happen to have um, an initial or something on, make very sure that you know which way your tin opens up so that um, you don't attach it upside down. So. The one thing about this adhesive tape is once it's down, it's down and you kind of have to just live with it because it's you'll completely ruin your pewter um, if you um, try and pull it off once it's down. So it gives us a little bit of time here to, to kind of audition it because I haven't touched, I haven't completely pressed down on it, but it's already attached. So, um, so I kind of line it up with my corners um, as best you can, and then press down on it. So mine is down, and I'm going to take some paper towel. And just with my paper towel, just smooth over the whole piece to make sure that the, the adhesive tape um, attaches well. And once I've done that for the center, I take the same paper towel and make sure that your finger is covered so that you don't cut yourself. 
and I'm going to go around the edge and just work it over the edge. And that's what's so neat about these little tins is that when you do a good burnishing job um, around the edges, it actually looks like the top um, engraved part, uh, sorry, the top embossed part um, is part of the tin. So get that down. Something went a little askew here. What you can also do is once you've got it down with the, the paper towel, you can use the side of your paper stump. And I usually take the side and I run it around the edge and push down. And that also burnishes um, it very nicely um, onto the surface of the tin. Go around. So the, the thing with the pewter is that it still needs to, you still need to allow it to, to stretch. And that's why if you do it a couple of times, um, then you get a really nice fit and it sits very, very well. So I'll let you guys do that. And then let me know when you're, um, you're done with that. If you happen to have uh, put your double-sided adhesive tape on and it was when you pulled the backing um, off, there was some of it, or when you applied the, the double-sided adhesive tape and then something like that would have happened and you had some of the edging stick out, that's what the X-Acto knife is for. Then you would just cut away at that because this little bit of sticky here um, you don't want to fight with it when it's already on the tin. So just a uh, heads up about that. Okay, so now we are pretty much have our um, little tin on the, on the box and we can apply some paints and talk about some paints. So in your notes, um, you'll notice that I gave you another little grid um, to tell you a little bit more about the different color options. So one is definitely um, the alcohol inks, which is great. You can apply them and then they can um, sit and, and they they really nice to, to apply to this. Um, again, the one um, drawback of the alcohol inks is that they do have a tendency to walk so they kind of sometimes creep over the edges um, and so on but the way that I would apply them and I'll just get a little bit of um, some palette paper give me a second I oh um, you can use your backing of your sukwang um, double-sided adhesive tape. So I normally just use a small brush and put a little bit of the alcohol ink on my on my palette. If I can find the brush that's reasonably clean. Okay, so just pop that little bit of that onto the, and then just use your your paint brush, and then just brush that on. And what's super nice about um, using the alcohol inks again is that beautiful transparency to them. And one of the things you might want to just keep in mind when you're doing the alcohol inks directly over the black marker is not to agitate it too much. So if I would go and rub, 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 rub here, I might potentially um, hydrate the pen and have it um, start coming out of the, the centers there. So that would be my alcohol inks. Just a little drop, use a paintbrush, and then just pop it on me. So that's one way of doing that. And I won't do the center part with that. Um, I kind of want to use another color. I might end up cleaning this one off. Okay, so that, that would be alcohol inks. There's also the option of using the glass paints. And these are kind of my favorite. And that's why I always do painting at the end of a, of a class because 
you can take your time with that. You can play with it a little bit. Um, sometimes people have other, you know, they want to do their own thing. They might want to color um, not specifically the, the circles. They might want to color the inside. And that's kind of a, a, um, a personal preference for everyone. So for the, the um, glass paint, the, I use the Pebby Over Trail. And this is a transparent one. And we'll just use, this is the um, sky blue. And it is water-based. So for the alcohol inks, when I use um, a, a paintbrush to apply that, I would just use some alcohol for my alcohol swab, and then obviously clean my brush um, because it's alcohol inks. And just give that a little clean. When I'm going to be using the um, oil-based, so this is oil-based glass paints, I'm going to use my baby oil in order to clean my brush with that. So give it a good shake. And it, because it's oil-based, oil um, it's very, um, it has quite a strong smell to it. And what... Uh, Anna Marie Oki, who works with um, this Perio paints a lot, is kind of suggests that um, you put a little bit out on a palette and then close it up so that you're not constantly uh, dealing with the fumes. So I'm going to not do that just for the sake of um, getting on with things. So load up my brush and then I should use it from the bottle and not from the and the nice thing about this is it flows nicely and it also, um, when it dries, it's almost like an enamel, like a um, very strong um, enamel look that you get over here. This one's a super pale um, color. I'll just drive it a little bit and then I'll let it sit. So you can see it's it's pretty liquid. Um, it flows nicely. And when I happen to do detailed um, uh, painting with this, what I like about it is if I don't have a lot of um, too much paint on my paintbrush, where you apply it, it sits very nicely and it doesn't um, uh, where you put it down, it stays and it doesn't tend to creep like the alcohol inks do. So let me know if you had some questions about the paints. Um, so I'm gonna clean my brush with the baby oil. And then I'll get you guys, um, if you're up for painting now, just get, let's, you know, you can go ahead and do that. But um, definitely if you have any questions right now, let me know. I'm going to clean off that alcohol there um, just so I have, um, I, I'll continue to paint with the, the glass paint. Just use an alcohol swab. And then I might have to put the black on as well um, because this, this will remove the black as well. So there we go. I'm going to get my alcohol off completely. It looks like my paint's pulled a little bit. Um, she's gonna just clean that up with a Q-tip. 
now or with um, and just get that excess out there while it's still still wet. So. Or I should just let it cool uniformly. I can certainly do that as well. And I can always go once my paint is dry. So the glass paint takes at least four hours to to be completely dry. So you're not going to fiddle with it um, until it's absolutely dry. Um, once it's dry, and if you feel that you want to add some more um, marker, you can certainly go over this this paint with the, the marker and it won't go anywhere. Whereas if you went over the marker again with where you applied the alcohol, it might actually um, disturb the, the alcohol. So something to keep in mind. And you can make this multicolored. I'm not sure why I'm so conservative. Let me be a little bit more bold. And I'm going to add all kinds of colors so that it looks like jewels. This is the Pepe Over Trail yellow. And let's see what happens. That's quite a beautiful amber look to it. is an apple green so we'll just go for gold and then i'll pop out and i'll go get my red as well and you can get a, a good look at how these colors look on the maple So obviously I can't help myself. I have to do something in <laughs> with some symmetry here. So I'll just do that. So I don't paint myself into a corner. And this is a uh, apple green, beautiful, nice, um, vibrant green. I really love using the glass paints on the on the metal. It's just so lustrous and um, just gives such a beautiful finish. These are, of course, all the Pebio paints. And at Michael's, they sell a little multi-pack for them as well. Um, okay. So you can get all the basic colors. Um, make sure you use a coupon because it's it's quite expensive. But they have a little sample pack and there's so much paint already in those little bottles that that's a really nice kit to, to use and um, to experiment with. I think okay. if you're, if you're going to be doing, I mean, alcohol inks are great. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I know, I think Patty does, does stock them, but um, I think just if you're going to be doing a lot more of this, you will just, love the look of the the glass paints because it has that lovely transparency um and then just when it's when it's finished it's extremely strong you okay. can't scratch it with your nail uh and so on um i did however seal this um with the 
spray paint. Um, and I always do that whenever I even, you know, when I use the, um, the black marker and so on, whenever you use um, some kind of addition to the, the pewter, and even sometimes when I don't, um, I always, always seal my project with the, the painter's touch, or it doesn't matter what, what sealant you'll use. I like using the Rust-Oleum uh, Rust painter's touch satin um, because it's it's shiny. You can certainly use the the, sh the um, shiny one of this. Um, I would just suggest not using the matte. So you can either do shiny or satin or um, preferably not matte because it gives you a very dull look. Unless you want to get the look of like age ten, then that would be a good choice as well. But then you always have to wait, of course, for your paints to be completely dry. And these are going to take a few hours um, to, to dry up. And I just <laughs> I just love how this actually ended up with looking almost like um, like gemstones, which is um, just quite, quite nice. Um, the, the little tins are available for purchase on Amazon and you can buy them 12 um, a lot and that that's that's quite a nice uh, little gift so um, even if you're gifting someone a gift card and you make a beautiful tin like this and put the gift card inside you know there's just a whole world of gifts that you can <laughs> cover with um, a personal um, project like this and you can always put an, an initial here so, for example, in the center here, you can, instead of um, painting over it, you could have, once it's filled with wax, you can engrave an initial in it and then paint over it for that matter. But if you want to really personalize things as well, that's, that's certainly an option too.